I'm, I'm sure that I could have fit more buzzwords into this talk title, uh, <laughs> but I decided to be lenient and, and stop there. Uh, thank you all for your time and attention. I know I'm competing with my good friend Ricky, and uh, I'm not surprised to, uh, to not see some folks in this room, but uh, hopefully we can have a good conversation about security, uh, especially the way that things change when we're considering uh, approaching security factors, and we're doing it in uh, large distributed uh, systems on the internet. So this might kind of dovetail a little bit nicely into uh, Rommel's talk about apps over software. Uh, so, you know, I just want to be as controversial as possible, so I'll just let him do all the heavy lifting and mention him. Um, so a few things to know right off the bat. Uh, when you're trolling me about this talk on Twitter, be sure to tweet at Casey West. And it's also a good way to reach out to me if you want to have a conversation about this talk. If you'd like to write me a screed in uh, denial of any of the things that I've said or to refute any of the things that I've said, you can email me and I'll do the job of uh, breaking that down into 140 character uh, chunks and putting it on Twitter for you. Uh, I also write things on the internet at caseywest.com, so you can find me there and find other ways to connect with me. And I happen to work for a company named Pivotal, and uh, they send me to places like this so I can meet people like you, and I'm thankful, so they get a bullet point. Uh, a little more about me. I'm a principal technologist for Cloud Foundry at Pivotal. Cloud Foundry is a large-scale uh, application development delivery platform. Um, it's a uh, member, the, the Linux Foundation has another sub-foundation called the Cloud Foundry Foundation, and, and we're all wrapped up into that. It's a very large open source project uh, that we work on a lot. Uh, which is great. I'm a former technical lead of applications and operations, a former failed VP of engineering, if we're being honest. Uh, and uh, X10 companies that you've never heard of, but more importantly, these are things I like. So if you like any of these things as well, then we should hang out. Um, there's no rock climbing emoji. What's up with that? All right, but so basically I'm just like you. Um, may the burning bridges light my path. Uh, so let's, Let's go ahead and dig in here. This is really a talk about operational excellence. So if you, um, if you wanted to hear more about you know, the nitty gritty of writing applications that are secure, this is more about running applications in an environment that's more likely to be secure than not. Um, so is anyone here running anything on the internet? In the cloud? Yeah, all right. What's the cloud, anybody? Can anyone please tell me? Is that someone else's joke, second time? All right. Let's do some more Q&A here. Um, so, so you do run software, right? Yes. OK, great. Um, has your system been attacked? Probably. OK, uh, so I didn't ask if you know if your system has been attacked. <laughs> so can we be honest? OK, yeah, yeah. Um, has it actually been compromised? Anyone been compromised? Isn't that fun? Yeah. It sucks. OK. Um, so why are systems attacked? Wh what's the main reason why uh, things get attacked on the internet? Does anybody have a? <sighs> Be because they exist, right, right, uh, nailed it. So systems are primarily attacked because they exist. Um, so if you put something on the internet, it's going to be attacked, and, and rather indiscriminately uh, in most cases. Uh, some of us may work on systems that are attacked on purpose because we work with sensitive information or for organizations that other people want access to or because you know, someone that we knew in our past doesn't like us anymore, you know, whatever it is. But primarily just they're there, so they'll be compromised. So uh, everything you know about security is wrong. Um, everything that, that we traditionally hold to be true when it comes to large-scale security, does anybody work for a company that self-identifies as an enterprise? It's always fun. By the way, speaking of enterprise, is this room not the holodeck? <laughs> and for as much as I'd rather be cooler than this, I feel like Wesley Crusher right now. But. Um, so everything, everything that you know about security is wrong generally in the cloud, now, now generally speaking. And I want to make this the new fortune cookie game where you add things to a fortune cookie or a pithy statement. Um, so just say in the cloud after, you know, whatever it is. Uh, I think, I think that, that can work out for us. So what we do with security, especially on large systems, and we're trying to migrate these systems into the cloud these days, is that we, we try and use this traditional approach of resisting change, right? I'm sure that uh, we've 
all uh, been party to the, uh, the, the traditional fight between developers trying to change things and operations folks trying to keep things the same. And it's no different in security. We set up uh, firewall rules and then we lock them down, right? And we try to keep it as static as possible. Let's not change this. Um, we, uh, we lock down the surface area on an operating system deployment or the, the number of network interfaces that we're, we're, uh, we're attaching to, the num number of facets in our system. And then we, we hope that if we keep it small and if we just don't look at it, then maybe no one else will either and it'll be okay. Um, or we, we do you know, a point in time pen test or some other kind of penetration testing. Maybe we do uh, an analysis because we bought a tool from some fancy security you know, company that, that says that if you run our tool, then you'll be safe, uh, lol. Um, then we do that and we get a report and then based on that report, we say our system is secure and if we don't touch it, everything is fine. But that isn't, that isn't really how uh, the world works with security um, because the longer it's there, the longer it exists, the more time people have to try and break it. So this is a, this is a trap, and it's a common trap because it's the way that we've been doing it for a long time. Does anybody, anybody have, have experienced this where we just don't want to change things and we think that's okay? Like uptime is still king for, for many people, you know? But things are changing, but we, we have this choice. This is what we think we have. We have the choice of going fast, right? And, and you know, as an engineer who builds like software and products, I want to go fast, but, but fast represents this unbounded risk. We don't necessarily know what we're getting, and we're going to get a lot of it, and we're going to get it frequently. Um, and then there's the false dichotomy that we're stuck with, or we'll go slow to mitigate risk, which is our traditional model. Um, but it turns out that going fast uh, with unbounded risk isn't always that bad if we're really careful about um, going fast. So we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, the advanced persistent threat is like the, the scariest thing that all of your security people are, are worried about. This is the, the breach that lasts for months or was uh, not detected for months, maybe never detected. The breach where someone gets into the edge of your system and then they're there uh, collecting more information, cred collecting credentials, eventually gaining access to other systems. Um, this is, uh, and there's been a lot of, lot of stuff written about uh, ATP, but broadly speaking, this is the most terrible terrifying thing uh, for your security folks uh, in your organization when you're running software. And this is what people are worried about. And the thing is that the way that we traditionally manage security, um, we force ourselves into a situation which gives us the, uh, a greater opportunity or a greater risk to be compromised in the long term like this. Um, and here's, here's the key thing about why attacks are successful. There are three key ingredients. Um, one is that they have time. Uh, the more time they have to try and access, penetrate a system or a network, uh, the more successful they're likely to be. So time is one. Um, they have leaked or misused credentials, right? So you've got passwords or some other secret that gets leaked, often because you know humans aren't very good at keeping secrets. Uh, we're not bad, we're just not good at it. Um, not bad people, necessarily. Sometimes we are, I guess. And the third one is um, misconfigured or unpatched software. So by n trying to change very little to mitigate risk, we put ourselves in the greatest possible uh, opportunity to be successfully attacked. <coughs> so the cool thing is that if we're using uh, cloud technologies and you know there are these IaaS providers that we have available to us um, that would range across the board from you know companies who do everything for us to maybe we run data centers with something like OpenStack on them. Um, they give us an opportunity to mitigate against these attack vectors and to change the nature of our security profile. But we have to be willing uh, to go fast. So let's go faster. Uh, a moving target is harder to hit. Uh, so rather than keeping things all the same, um, what if we, we change things up? And these are going to be some, some pretty simple concepts, but hopefully um, they'll, they'll jog your, your mind a little bit or give you the opportunity to maybe have a deeper conversation about how you manage security, because the way you manage security actually has a lot to do with the way that you operate and manage your software in production anyway. Um, so why, would, why, would, why the cloud in particular? Well, um, there's this concept of, uh, that I've, I've been trying to talk about for the last year or so called cloud native operability. Um, cloud native is kind of a weird, funky other buzzword that I didn't throw into the title just to uh, hopefully get people to actually come to this talk. Um, but I think that we can actually nail this down. 
Um, so there are four key components um, to doing cloud-native software and especially operating cloud-native software. So one of them is the architecture itself. And composable architectures seem to be proving pretty successful at delivering software into the cloud effectively, being able to do it at larger and larger scale. Sometimes we call this you know, microservices architectures. Maybe you want to call it serverless. Uh, you can call it whatever you want. But generally, a composed architecture, right? The thing that makes Linux great, you know, we have small tools that we can compose. Same thing seems to be working out well in larger distributed systems. So we also need automated processes. Uh, we have to automate our path to production. Um, and in fact, if there's anything that's the key ingredient for this particular uh, aspect of doing cloud-native software, it's automating your path to production. We need a collaborative culture. We need a culture where we can work and, and share together. And that's an important part of operations is actually the culture. And finally, we need some sort of production environment that's actually a good place for our applications to live rather than a terrible place. If production is always a tire fire, then it doesn't matter how fast you get software into production. You're just adding fuel to the flames, right? Um, so we need all of these things. So another way to think about it, uh, maybe more uh, specifically, is things like microservices, continuous delivery, um, DevOps as a cultural practice, as a collaborative practice, and having some sort of structured production environment that makes it easy for our applications to run and is highly automated, right? We need those things. Um, so, so here's the real trick. And it's based on work uh, from one of my colleagues who, um, who worked in security at, at companies like Google and, and now works at Pivotal too. But he uh, talks about the three R's. And this is the, these are the key concepts. When we're doing security in the cloud, um, we need to think about, uh, or at a large scale even, we need to think about security differently. And he boils it down to these three concepts, which I want to share with you. So we have rotate, uh, repave, and repair. So the first thing is to rotate credentials. And we can do this every few minutes or, or even every few hours. Um, in order to rotate credentials quickly, we need to manage them carefully, right? So this plays into our architecture, our architectural decisions. Um, if we have hard-coded credentials and hard-coded access to dependency services in our architecture, then it's going to be difficult for us to swap out a password that gives a, an application access to a database uh, and then do that just on, on the regular, right? But if we change passwords frequently, then the chance that them being leaked being an actual attack vector decreases. Because if the password doesn't exist when your attacker tries to use it, you're good to go, right? This can be quite challenging uh, because it challenges this idea that we should have static systems and that uh, something static is actually more secure. And credentials will leak, and I said this before, human, humans are really weak. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, and maybe we can make a song out of it sometime. Um, but, but humans uh, are the, the weak link in our architecture, in, in, our, in our software strategy. Um, if, your delivery, if your software delivery process is, has human beings managing passwords, uh, then you've got a problem. And just so that we're clear, um, how many of us are using something like, a, a, like HashiCorp's Vault or something else like that in, in our production environment to manage secrets? Some other you know, encrypted secrets database. A handful of us, that's good. Um, I, I don't know if you'll raise your hand for this, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Uh, configuration files that you generate using uh, maybe configuration management or something else? OK. And then maybe you know, your configuration management tool has some sort of a secret manager. Um, Hard-coded in our code? Yeah? For the record, I happen to think that uh, um, Generated configuration files are synonymous with hard-coded in our code. We can pretend that YAML isn't an important part of our software just because it's not written in PHP or Python, but we're really just pretending. Um, OK, so, so when I talk about humans generating or managing passwords for us, it's important to consider how passwords come into existence. Uh, passwords come into existence because they had to, be, had to be generated from somewhere. And if they're generated from somebody's brain or their mind, um, if they're copy and pasted around in a, in a trouble ticket you know, between, between uh, teams within your organization, then you're allowing human beings to manage something that should never, ever be managed by humans. Humans should never see passwords. In fact, I'm an optimistic person, so I would like all of us to agree that from this day forward, if a human being generates a password for you in your production environment, I want you to reject it and say, no, I'm not going to use that password. Let's have a computer automatically generate it 
even better, let's throw that generation into some sort of a pipeline or routine um, continuous delivery that can change it frequently so that we can just push a button or even uh, fully automate on a schedule the changing of, that, of those credentials. I mean, we all cycle our credentials every, every couple of hours, right? In my mind, everyone raised their hand. So it is possible with a high degree of automation. If we go back to the concept of cloud native operability, your architecture has to be built in a way that supports this. At a bare minimum, if you're doing something like 12-factor applications, who's heard of that concept? 12-factor apps, it's pretty popular. You can go to 12factor.net, the number 12factor.net. It's a good starting place for architecting applications for the cloud. So they'll work better in a distributed environment uh, and in a, in a cloud-like environment than if you don't adhere to these constraints. And one of those constraints is to get our configuration information from our environment, to have it injected into our application. So our runtime environment can inform our application about where our database lives and how we access it, right? Rather than hard coding that into our code or rather than generating a configuration file and placing it on a disk somewhere, right? We can just inspect the environment. So if we have the automation around deployment and managing those services, and if they're built with 12-factor apps, then we have the opportunity to manage passwords more effectively, or secrets in general. So repaving. Repave every server application every few minutes or hours. Now, what does repave mean? Um, who likes just turning things off? Yeah, see, I do. Um, and then uh, what's, the, what's the common uh, consideration for how many instances of something you have to be running in order for it to be call, considered high availability? Like there's a minimum number. Does anybody have? Yeah, I see three. Three is, is generally the answer, right? Um, so if you already have more than three, hopefully, of something, and you turned one off, well, what would happen? It would be okay, right? probably be okay. Now, in order for it to be okay, you have to have something like a load balancer that does health checks and can notice when an instance disappears so it doesn't send traffic to that in non-existent instance, right? And if you want to add more, you have to have a load balancer that can be automatically updated without having a maintenance window or some downtime, right? So if you want to change the shape and the size of your architecture, you need to be able to do that very dynamically. So it's not just turn things off and on again and everything is, is fine. Um, that's not necessarily the case. But if we use something like containers, I happen to, happen to be kind of into containers. Who's heard of containers? That's a common one that we should probably stop saying in 2017. Yeah. Um, so, so if we use something like containers, they're actually pretty awesome because they have a life cycle that, that, uh, that we have to adhere to. There are some constraints that we get from using containers to package and deliver software um, that are actually really powerful. So our life cycle is that we have to build a container, right? Sometimes we do that on our laptop. Hopefully we mostly do that in, in build pipelines, right? In our CI or CD tool. Uh, we have to deploy that container into an environment somewhere. Sometimes this means deploying it into a registry or a repository in our production environment or close to our production environment. And then we get to our next phase, which is that then we get to run this thing, right? And there's only one other thing that we can really do with containers, um, which is to stop them. Uh, so if your deployment process right now includes modifying things in place, you don't have that luxury with containers. Containers are meant to be immutable artifacts, right? Um, there was a talk uh, earlier this week by uh, Valerie Young on uh, deterministic builds and the idea of the importance of having a deterministic build that you build, when you build and compile some piece of software, you should be able to get the same result, even bit for bit, uh, and, and be able to prove that you get the same result as someone else in a similar architecture and with a, a similar configuration. Um, and that's really critical, and containers kind of give us the opportunity to do things like this too, right? We have this immutable artifact, and it's a snapshot or a point in time, and we can move that thing around, and we know that it's always the same thing. Um, but in distributed systems, we don't just build, uh, deploy, run, and stop. Um, we build some immutable artifact, right? Hopefully it's semantically versioned or <laughs> something like that. Uh, then we deploy this artifact, and then we run, 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 run this artifact, which is great. Uh, but there's no modify in place, so what do you do when you want to change the artifact? You, you, go, you build a new one, right? You go back through this process. So we, and we can also stop, right? We can also stop it. So this is, this is where repave comes in. 
Um, on a regular basis, your application is running in an environment. It's susceptible to attack. Maybe it even gets compromised. Um, what if it disappears, though? Right? How long are you compromised if it disappears and gets replaced with a version from a known good state? Right? And what if you do that frequently, incredibly frequently? Um, then you mitigate the risk of time and access because uh, if we turn it off and on again, then a server that doesn't exist isn't being compromised. Uh, and this is, this is pretty powerful um, and definitely flies in the face of almost everyone I've ever talked to in an IT organization who says if it's not running for a long time, it's probably bad. Um, and I think, uh, <laughs> I think this is a, a reason why, why serverless is interesting, too, as a concept, right? These functions that get executed based on some event model. Is anyone using uh, Lambda or an equivalent type of technology right now? So the, uh, these things are pretty cool. Now, from, from, from my perspective, I'm, I'm old school. Uh, so I've been doing serverless for uh, nearly 20 years. It's called Perl CGI's, and um, <laughs> it's really, you know, everything that's old is new again. It's all good. But it's the same concept. If it's not running, then it's less likely to be compromised, right? And that's pretty interesting. So one of the things that we can do, again, uh, pipelines are kind of the crux of this whole thing. If we automate our delivery to production, and if we can automate that, uh, uh, as a push button one step process, then we can on a rolling schedule just blow things away. We don't necessarily have to change it. This isn't about uh, a rapid rate of change of your software, although it can lead to uh, that result. This is actually just turning things off and on all the time, right? Um, and we have the opportunity to do this. Uh, the cloud makes it particularly easy. Containers make it really easy. If you have a container scheduler, um, you can uh, just go in and blow some away <laughs> and say, you know, well, I wanted 50 or 100 or some dynamic amount of, of, uh, of capacity based on, you know, incoming expectations. And you can just blow some away sometimes and the container schedule will come back and, like, turn, turn some back on again and everything is fine, right? It's actually pretty brilliant, rel relatively easy to do. You can do the same thing with, with virtual machines if you have, um, if you have these things pre-built and they're easy to spin up if you, if you use um, images effectively. So it's important to note that repave is not patch. So repave isn't, isn't update something, right? Because there's no modify. We're going to work with immutable artifacts. And immutable artifacts mean that whenever I deploy version 2.0.0 of my application, it's always version 2.0.0. And when I want dot one, you know, that's a new artifact. And the important thing here is that if one of these virtual machines or one of these containers gets broken into, um, it's going to disappear in a couple of minutes. And it's not good that it got uh, compromised, but we have severely mitigated the, the opportunity for that compromise. Not only that, we're changing our passwords within our production environment every few minutes as well, which means that when they get in, uh, because of some password that they got access to, or if they get access to some sensitive secret once they're on the file system and poking around, that thing is gone again too, right? So now we're making their job harder and harder. So don't worry about uptime so much, right? That's, that's one thing. I, I used to be, you know, like, hey, I had this server running for 10 years, and now I realize, like, that was the riskiest thing I could have possibly done. It was not a source of pride after all. All right, repair. So we want to repair vulnerable runtime environments, again, every few minutes or, or every few hours. Now, what are runtime environments? It, it, when we, when uh, uh, Valerie talked about um, deterministic builds, the, the build environments have to be reproducible and known uh, so that anyone can use them. And that's a, an important part of the developer and release process. But uh, where your applications run have to be just as deterministic. And it's important to make runtime be something that everyone can fully understand and can be re reproducible. So we need to repair our applications. Um, so if our application has a security flaw, maybe it allows uh, some data uh, into the database that isn't being properly uh, escaped, and then, you know, you've got a problem. Hopefully we've solved that problem by now, but, but maybe, you know, something along those lines. Maybe we just need to fix, you know, whatever security bug. We need to be able to do that as quickly as possible. Again, pipelines provide the answer, that if you can make a small deterministic change to your application and push a button to get it back out uh, into your production environment, then you're more likely to be able to solve uh, security problems this way. But we need to do it for runtime environments as well. If you have a Ruby app or a Rails app and there's an issue in Ruby or Rails, you need to be able to roll out new Ruby and Rails environments as well. 
Uh, and, then on, and then after you've rolled out the, uh, that environment, you need to be able to roll out your application. Same thing goes for servers. Servers can be compromised. Operating systems are often the reason why servers are compromised. Uh, so, you know, when, when Shellshock or something like that comes out and you get the patch from upstream, you need to be able to roll it out to your production environment as quickly as possible. And one of the things that I found uh, before I worked at Pivotal, I worked for a web security company, and we had to, we decided, <laughs> I didn't have to, this was my call, maybe good, maybe bad. Um, Back when you know, the front page of Docker said never run Docker in production, we were like, hey, we're a security company, let's totally do this. So we started rolling these things out, and what we found was um, uh, management of images is actually quite challenging as they proliferate, right? Um, and in, if you're building one or two, uh, it's something that you can manage with a couple of pipelines, not too bad. Um, but we had a, a software architecture that was pretty polyglot. We were delivering applications written in Java, Perl, Python, Node, uh, static for the front end, um, and we had some Ruby in there too, Ruby on Rails. So that was, a, that was a bunch of stuff that we were trying to deploy across about a thousand node virtual machine cluster. And even more than managing them out in production was how the hell we even got them into production in the first place. because. Uh, we had to manage the uh, base operating system and its environment and versions, and then we had to manage the runtime environments on top of that as well. So the trick that we found is that we can build intermediate images uh, and, then, and then compose our applications on top of those intermediate images. The trick wasn't so much, hey, we can build a, an Ubuntu image and then we can build a Ruby on Rails image and a, and a Perl image over here. That wasn't even really the trick. The trick was automating everything in Jenkins. Right. The trick was that we could have cascading builds so that whenever we rebuilt Ubuntu to handle Shellshock, it kicked off a rebuild and integration test for the Ruby environment and the Perl environment and so on. And that kicked off integration tests and rebuilds for all of our application level images as well. And we pushed all of these things into the, uh, the Docker uh, repositories and away we went. So, we had to uh, automate this path to production. Again, that was the most critical thing that we did in order to be able to manage these virtual machines. So we need to be able to repair quickly, and automation is the only way that I know to do that. How many of us have, um, have a release process that you would consider to be an event? Like it's a, it's a thing that happens that like people know about. You take a day or a weekend. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so that's maybe only a couple of folks. Out of curiosity, how many of you are doing something like continuous delivery where releasing isn't really that big of a deal? Okay, that's, that's great. So uh, of the people who raised their hand, uh, it was about half and half, and then another half of the room uh, failed to comment, refused to, to comment, I guess. That's fine. So how many of us also have like a patch priority process or a P0 or hot fix process where when something really hits the fan, all of a sudden you can get something out in a, in a couple of hours, a couple of days, or, or even less than a day, right? Yeah, so I've had that too. Um, and I've had limited success uh, trying to convince people of what I'm about to tell you, uh, but I'm going to give it a go again because I'm an optimist. Uh, so. Your patch priority or hotfix process is your most agile, continuous delivery capable delivery process in your organization, right? And, and there's a reason. Uh, the reason is uh, the size of change, the, the amount of change that you're trying to deploy. Um, so when we are trying to fix a, a CVE that came from some upstream, we change one thing, right? We review that change, or even, uh, let's say, a bug in our software that's, that a user noticed. We, we change one tiny thing. It's deterministic. You can look at the diff and have a pretty good idea about how it's going to behave when it hits production, right? But on your typical release cycle, even when it's every week or every two weeks, um, which can be very fast for some of us, you have an accumulation of a great deal of change that you're about to deliver, which increases the risk that when you ship that to production, it's going to break. But our hotfix is the opposite of that. It's the tiniest possible change you could make. We have a high degree of confidence that it's going to behave the way we expect it to when we hit production, and that's how we can circumvent all of the processes that we built up to mitigate the risk of deployment. And what I think is amazing about this is that the longer we wait, the more, bat the more changes we accumulate on top of one another, the higher degree the risk uh, of failure is in that deployment. We bring that upon ourselves, and then our response to that is to increase the process around deployment 
because we're afraid it's going to fail, right? It's a, it's a circle that, that goes downhill. Um, the thing I want to convince you of is to make everything a hotfix, right? Everything should be deployed in the tiniest, small, smallest batch change, and that's actually continuous delivery, right? Then you can be more deterministic, you can have a higher degree of confidence, and that's the point. And if you have a higher degree of confidence, then you can increase velocity of change, which can respond to anything from a bug to a CVE to even deploying features, um, with reduced risk, which is the, the goal in any of this stuff anyway, to reduce risk. So uh, that's what we need to do. So the future of security here is, is build pipelines. <laughs> um, how many of us have automated builds? How many of us have automated deployments? OK, yay. That's a pretty decent number. Try to bake in things like uh, upstream CVE um, patches into your automated builds. Try to bake in a, a credential rotation into your automated builds. Um, try, to, um, try to bake in just uh, doing a rolling uh, deploy where you turn everything off that's on right now. Um, and then spin new things up. Try and turn, build that into your automated builds. And what's interesting is you can do these as independent steps, but eventually it can actually just be part of a very sophisticated deployment process, right? How many of us are responsible for doing zero downtime deployments right now? Or, or we have a mandate that we should be doing deployments without downtime? Yeah. How many of us have a 5.9's SLA? Yeah. Which is how, ma how many minutes do you get off every year for 5.9's? You get like five, roughly. Yeah. So, so we want to automate deployment. We want to do rolling deploys. And we can actually do this from a security perspective. So if you've been having trouble convincing product management or someone else that you should actually get time to work on uh, the automation and deployment of your software, go talk to the security folks. Because I bet that they can get you time. Nobody wants to get sued. So we want to repair all of it, and, and we do want to do it constantly. So rather than uh, trying to avoid change to mitigate risk, I would say let's embrace change to mitigate risk. Um, for what it's worth, uh, I've been helping some pretty large companies implement this process, and it's actually working, right? We're, at, we're seeing um, a higher degree of confidence that the changes we make will reduce risk over time. That's a general good. And we're also uh, not seeing uh, as successful of penetration attempts, even when the security team attempts to break their own stuff, right? Uh, which is really great. So this is less of a trap in the cloud. So to, uh, to recap the three R's, this, this is really the crux of it, is that we should constantly rotate credentials. We should constantly repave applications and servers, and we should constantly repair vulnerabilities. Um, try to keep Try to keep your, your static things to a minimum, right? And, and this, is, this allows us to, uh, to starve an attacker from the three essential elements that they need in order to be successful. They don't have enough time, they don't have valid credentials, and they have less unpatched software to try and attack, right? So that's, that's the goal. I'm a little bit early on my end here, but... Uh, if you have any questions, we can go there. Uh, if you want to be friends with me on the internet, uh, that's my, my Twitter handle. And if you want to be friends with me in real life, we can drink those beers. Um, well, not those. Those are emoji, actually. So that'll be more challenging. But oh, thank you.